Welcome to our study in the book of Colossians. And today we have the blessing of beginning chapter one. If you did not listen to the introduction, uh, I would recommend that you do so. But this uh, you can start here and be fine without any problem. And so the journey needs to begin here. And uh, some maps are very important. So let's take a look at where Colossae is. If you, of course, follow the, the red line, you can see that it's underlined on this map. It is in present day Turkey, um, along with a lot of these cities. Most of them you would recognize, a lot of them from the seven churches of Revelation. But there are others. Here's a little bit better. Uh, Colossae had no seaport, uh, a lot of mountains around her. She didn't have a main artery, which uh, on this map is shown in the red. And of course, you can see Laodicea is very close. Here is a topographical uh, map. You can see the mountain valleys and the way to Ephesus. Uh, you'd have to go through Laodicea, of course. And that's 120 miles to the seaport. And uh, this is the trade route. This is the route that people would uh, basically in ship go once you got to a seaport. So you can see uh, Colossae is the beginning there, 120 miles to, uh, to Ephesus and then up uh, through the Aegean Sea, into the Ionian, around and up to Rome, where Paul was. And he was in prison when he wrote this book and sent it with Epaphras back to here. Here's the outline that we'll be following, and it will be highlighted each week. Uh, as we make progress so that you can see exactly where we are. And of course, we're in chapter one. And uh, the theme of this one is dominant, the head of the body, Jesus Christ. We get a lot of instructions and you'll see some of these things today as we get into the book. And so let me get started right off the bat. Verses one and two, we would normally call an introduction and it is an introduction, but I have put applicable things that I've found uh, within these verses, and I've titled them and tried to make them very personal, uh, very something we can understand and we can take away with us. So let's get right into this, and you'll see what I mean uh, by the bookends at the beginning. Here we go. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Uh, I, if you're just joining me and I'm brand new to you, uh, the words that are underlined show up below, and then the Greek uh, follows that if it's in quotes. For instance, under God, the word Greek is not in the Greek. It just means God is theos in the Greek. So I'm not spending a lot of time on the definitions. Definitely Jesus, Jehovah's salvation, and Christ, the anointed one. They translate that way all the time. So if you can remember that Jesus means Jehovah is our salvation, is my salvation. He is salvation, and Christ is the anointed one. The three keys that I call attention to in this lesson is Paul was an apostle. Paul was of Jesus Christ. He knew the Lord. He loved the Lord. He followed God. He lived and died for Christ. And then he did it, though, by the will of God, that God had called him. God had burdened his heart. And, and uh, you know the story of, of the Damascus Road. He was blinded. God really did a work in his life. And that was God dealing and Paul finding God's true will for his life. To the saints, saints are not dead people. Now, they can be, but saints are holy ones. That's how that's translated. And the word and there should be translated even. So may I read that way to the saints, even faithful brethren in Christ. So if you know Christ is your savior, if you have trusted the Holy One, Jesus Christ, 
in the, in the blood that he shed on the cross and received him as your savior, uh, that this would be you. You would be a saint. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're better than everyone else and holier than thou. Uh, does speak though of holiness and that we should walk in holiness and be holy. So to the saints, even faithful, saints are faithful people, brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what I want to emphasize this word grace to you because this is this is the bookend principle that I want to leave with you before we leave this section. I was studying in the last couple years the book of Zechariah, and when I saw grace written there, um, and, and I turned to the last chapter of Colossians also to the last verse, and just I don't think I was surprised for what I found there, and I'll show that to you in a minute. I came across this one verse, and it had grace, comma grace unto it, and I said that's odd. Uh, why double back-to-back -back words? Well, the comma is important there, and in the Hebrew in this case, and the Jews understood this. To, to a, a Jew, they uh, would never question. You wouldn't have to ask them what this what's this mean. They know. And it, it should read this way, grace to grace. And what the comma is saying is basically from first to last in every situation is God's grace. God's grace is first and, and then live through that situation and you'll find God's grace at the end. It is ongoing. And so when we are Christians and we know the Lord, we have experienced God's grace. God's grace has, was, was at work before we were born. And it always has been. And so here's, here's the interesting thing. Here's the last verse of Colossians. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Look, grace be with you. And, and at the very beginning, uh, it talked about grace with us, with you. And here are the bookends. Colossians starts with grace, from grace to grace. It ends in grace. So this church was living, and its life was a picture of God's grace. It's interesting that we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, uh, keep in mind, we're living in the dispensation of the age of grace. Yes, it's called the church age, but we're living in the age of grace. And grace produces true thanksgiving. So I thought I'd share that with you. If you take nothing away from today's lesson, maybe this is what's touched your heart, that God's grace, as Paul said, your grace, or, or Jesus told Paul this, my grace is sufficient for you. When Paul was down and, and really it just had lost, it was discouraged, and God told him, my grace will get you through. It is sufficient. And so today, live grace to grace. You're right in the middle of it. You can't get away from it. All right. If you were to come to our church, we have something that's called a connection class. The connection class is open to anyone that is interested in learning more about our church and or wanting to join. And joining is a possibility at the end of the course. It lasts four weeks. It's taught by the pastor and the number two pastor. Uh, the lead pastor, the main pastor, when we took it, did the first three weeks is what he did. And then on the fourth week, the, the number two pastor came in and did the financial and then took us on a walking tour of the church plant. Uh, this was an incredible class. There was like 30 people when we were in it. And at the end, we could just make note and hand it to uh, a host or hostess that was there. And the pastor would get back to us, make an appointment if we wanted to join, and we'd come in and he'd talk with us, and then he'd present us to the church. If you just wanted the information about the church, you could come and go. Uh, you've been through the class, and maybe a year later you want to join, then you'd call the church office and make an appointment and say that. But you'd been through the connection class. It's a great um, 
it's a great thing where you learn the doctrinal statement and the statement of faith. You learn the pastors. You learn uh, governance of the church, um, the ministries of the church. You just get a great overall view of it. And the interesting thing about the connection class is that at one time they had it two, three times a year. Um, now it's almost ongoing, and it almost always has over 20 in it. Um, and I've been in the church over a year now. So right now as I speak, uh, there's a connection class that will meet Wednesday night. So I invite you to the connection class at Colossae. Let's visit this church and come on in and let me walk you through the connection class and introduce you to this church. And it might be something you might want to join. It might be a church that you'd say, hey, I like that. I want to be part of that. And so here's the connection class in these verses. And we're going to pick out some things that we understand and we, we can see that's this church in action. And keep in mind, this church is a missionary planted church. The Apostle Paul led Timothy and Epaphras to the Lord, and these men went here and started the church. And so these are first-generation converts. This is a missions church that grows to be a dynamic church. And so Paul writes and he says, we give thanks. We means Timothy and others that we find in the last chapter to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Praying in the, in the Greek is continual action, meaning he says, I'm praying all the time. Just like he says, praying always, praying all the time for you. Do you know what? There is someone who's praying for you. There may be a lot of people who are praying for you, but I guarantee you that there is someone who prays for you. All right, verse 4. Since or after we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. Wow, this is getting interesting about the people of this church. I like this church. And so here, their faith, Paul has heard of their faith of Christ and it's strong and it's reached all the way to Rome, meaning they have a great testimony of sharing Christ in the community and in their, and in their daily walk. And the other thing that is very interesting that Paul was thankful for them for was the love that they had to all the saints. And so this is, this is really good. Their faith in Christ is... See, look back in verse 2. It talks to them about them faithful brethren. So they have dynamic faith in Christ, and they are because of that faith, they are faithful in loving and serving the brethren and the, and the, and the other saints in the church. So this is a very giving church. Love gives. So, wow. Verse 5, for the hope which is laid up or stored up for per, like for personal use in the, in the Greek, for you in heaven... Wherefore, you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And so we've been introduced already to three words, faith and hope, or faith and love, and now we get hope. And these are the things to walk in. And they have hope because they've received the gospel. Hope in what? Well, they have hope in the fact that they're saved. They look forward to going to heaven, and their hope is in Jesus Christ and his blood. But but they have great hope that their service is going to the Lord on earth will be dynamic and that they understand that they're not going to have a whole lot this side of heaven and there are rewards for the child of God awaiting for us and that's their hope too which is come unto you as it is in all the world and brings forth fruit hope brings forth fruit and so these people have a lot of spiritual fruit of sharing the gospel, teaching the word of God, serving, taking care of somebody, witnessing, as it does also in you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God and truth. The word knew in the Greek, and I don't usually put the word down here, but it's epigonosko. Gnosko means no, but this is no on steroids. It means no thoroughly inside and out. And they knew inside and out, they experience the grace of God in truth as it really is. And so things didn't always go right for them here. But here's a church that bears fruit. They were excited about things of God. God was at work in them. 
and they knew inside and out, they experienced it, the truth of God, living the gospel inside and out. And verse 7, I introduce you to their pastor, Epaphras, as you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Epaphras, as I told you, co-started this church. And the word minister here means one who takes care of the needs of others. Man, this is kind of pastor that, I, that I'd like to have. I actually have that in reality. But in looking at this church, and if I was thinking to join this church, what does it have to offer me? The man of God is a minister. He has the heart of the sheep of the people within his heart. He reaches out and he touches them and he, and he does what is needed to move them forward for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Epaphras was here and uh, he wrote to Paul about, about heresy. We can read that in Philemon 23. Philemon's a member of this church. But there was an issue came up and uh, he wrote about taking care of that. But there's some other issues that we'll see as we go along. But all of a sudden, I like this church, who also, this is Epaphras, Epaphras declared or made plain unto us your love in the Spirit. Here's a pastor that declared, he didn't go grumbling to Paul about, I have this member's this and this member doesn't do this and they're not faithful here. He declared not a, his, the, the love that they had in the Spirit and the love that they had for him to Paul and reported that to him. And Paul said, I'm just thrilled over that. And the word declare here means plain. So here's a pastor, and even in his teaching, his preaching, he made it plain so people could understand. So in our connection class, I've come up with these things that interest me. One, they had faith and they had faithfulness. Wow. Two, they had love for one another. They were givers. They gave their time, their money, their possessions, their love. Three, they had hope. Hope not just of going to heaven, but knowledge and hope that there are rewards there awaiting them. They had fruit. They had people that led to the Lord. They had people that were learning God's word. They had, they had people using the gifts of the fruit of the Spirit in their lives, and it was evident in this church. They knew the grace and truth of God, knew it well. They had a faithful pastor, and yes, they had a pastor that was easily understood. He was plain. He could take them from where they were to where they need them, needed to be. See, they were on a path, and they were moving, and he, he was there to lead the way and encourage and to keep people on the path. We thank the Lord for ministers that do this and are faithful to God's word, and we say amen to them. And so let's look at the remainder of our time right now, just in this section, the path to walk, the steps to take. This is, uh, this is the direction that the church was going, the path they were walking, and the, the steps they were taking within this. And in here... In the first in verses 9 to 12 is the path to walk and Paul prays for this church in specific areas so in the verses in this first little section here watch how this reads out wisdom and we'll be looking at these six things these are six things on the these are major light posts on the path to keep us going we pick up other tools along the way off of the path wisdom leads to a worthy walk which makes you fruitful in your work, which give us increased knowledge of God's will, which provides strength for your warfare in difficult circumstances, which results in worship. All right, I think we can understand that and let's get into it. I will, these words, these six things will be highlighted in these verses as we looked at them a little bit more in a little more depth. All right, so keep in mind, Paul's praying for this church in these areas. You already saw the, some of these back in the connection class section, that they were, already, they were already well on their way in implementing these things and walking in these, this light. 
So let's get underway, and here we go. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Once again, Paul just bathes this whole first chapter in this church in prayer. And to desire that you might be filled or complete with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So this is a great opening statement for Paul to say, we are praying, first of all, for wisdom for you and spiritual understanding. Spiritual means belonging to the Holy Spirit. If you look at somebody and say, they, th that's a spiritual Christian, all right? What's happening is the Spirit of God is, has done a work within, and you're seeing the work of God getting done without, through the power of the Spirit within, and we're seeing we're seeing tools of the scriptures in use. We see the fruit being magnified and growing. Hope that'll understand a little bit what's going on. So what is a spiritual Christian? They're not going to, first of all, they don't think they are. And number two, if, if they think they are and tell you, then they're not. How's that sound? But here's the summary of this, this verse. What Paul is saying I really pray for you that you really know God. Know God, not just know God, but know the, get the down deep, really know God on steroids. And secondly, what he asks of us. And the goal is wisdom. Everything will, will emanate from there. And so the steps to take are sort of tools in verses 10 to 12. We've just done nine. And we're going to go all the way through 12 with this. You'll see them. They will tell us what these things involve. Good deeds, continual spiritual growth, uh, leaning on God's power for endurance, patience, and joy, expressing thanks for all things so that we can share in God's people's inheritance. And so you see the hope and you see the love and you see the joy is sort of oozing through these things. But these are the outward manifestations of the, of the path things. As we walk the path and we build our lives within. So here we go. And keep in mind, what's in green is the path to walk. These are lampposts on the path. That you might walk worthy. Actually, in the Greek, it, talks, it really means that you might walk about. That you'd be a walkabout. That we conduct our life pleasing to the Lord. That's what it's talking about. As we go here and we go there, it's almost like he knew that we lived in, a, in an expressway society, that we're always going somewhere. And so he says, and your walkabouts, wherever you go, conduct your life pleasing to God, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing is in the Greek growing by the knowledge of God. We increase our knowledge of God by growing in it. So it's a process. We're not full grown. We don't know everything, but we gain knowledge of God by studying the Word of God and hearing the Word of God. So based on the knowledge received, they'd be walking a worthy life of a believer. These are, these are, this is, we're on the right path. Strengthened with all might, we're still on the right path. According to his glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joy. Okay, and so there's strength from the Lord is present as we walk and give it, as we walk, the Lord wants to give us, walking in the word of God and living it, give us patience and long-suffering with joy. All right. Patience is talking about circumstances. So being calm, collected, and when circumstances go wrong, you don't become impatient, or do we? The long-suffering is patience to, for people. Actually, long-suffering means slow burn, long fuse, and we just... Don't blow our stacks over people because of what they've done or what they've said or what they're not doing. So 
may be a good evidence of strength of a Christian is how patient and how long-suffering are we. Hmm. Through 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Saints in the light are is we've walked in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That's the first Bible verse I ever memorized. Giving thanks unto the Father. The word fit means to to be authorized or to qualify, to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Let's talk about children or light. And then let me give you the opposite, children of darkness. Don't know if you recall back in the Gospels, Jesus called the Pharisees children of darkness. You walk in darkness. And he talked about people of, of walking in light. People that found Christ as their Savior, they understood, they see biblical principles. And this was a common thing for the Jews. They, they, they to this day still believe that Gentiles are children of darkness and the Jews are children of light. If you go to Israel today, you go to Jerusalem, go to Hebrew University, this is where you will find the Shrine of the Scrolls. Uh, this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls are found. They are underground. They're underneath here. This is the top. And to give you perspective of how big these two items are, do you see the skirt wall around the black uh, uh, structure? You can walk over there and sit down on it. It's made so you can just sit and not have a hard time getting up. All right, so it goes that high. The white structure in the back is like the top of a jar and where like the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And it's under here that this goes all the way down and basically the jar is where you're in is the concept they wanted you to think when you go underground and look at the Dead Sea Scrolls on display. Now, they built this because they're contrasting the children of darkness and the children of light. Children of light are represented by God's word. Children of darkness want nothing to do with it. And so, verses, we finish there, and we, this is sort of a good wrap-up for us. Here's some reminders of what God has done for us in verses 13 through 14. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness? Remember, we are just talking about children of light saints of light but god is we were all in darkness and god through his power the power of the cross has delivered us from the power of the darkness the power of sin the power of hell and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son so delivered is freedom to do unhindered it's liberty of action translated means in the in the Greek move from one place or literally to remind them and this is very very Jewish the word translate is just a is a is what they believe in I don't want to use the word catchphrase but it reminds them of the exiles of old when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the city and took tens of thousands of them back to Babylon into exile when the Assyrians came to the Northern Kingdom in three different times and took and routed their cities and took them before they defeated them totally and took them back to their empire into different areas of it and made them as slaves. And they, that's, they, they were to live there and die there. And so they're in exile, but to be translated is that God miraculously moved them from one place after 70 years, I'm talking about Babylon, and they're in slavery there, they're exiled there. God brings them back to his land. They've been translated. They look to the Jew, it's as if they were in hell, and they're back in heaven. But that's not really hell or really heaven. 
But there's that as the contrast of what's going on here and what needs to be shared with you concerning this. So delivered and translated are throwbacks to the Old Testament times. God would constantly demonstrate his power to his people by deliverance and translation. The point, however, being made here is that it is now all possible and only possible through the blood of Jesus in whom we're redeemed and forgiven. And so we end this section with this verse, in whom Christ capitalized, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Redemption means complete release based on a payment of a price. Jesus paid our sin debt, our sin price on the cross. He has redeemed us through his blood from the curse of the law, Paul said in Galatians. And it is in him and him only that we are redeemed. And when we are redeemed, we are not just redeemed, we have forgiveness of sins. And we say, Amen, Hallelujah, praise God. Wow. So I want to thank you uh, for listening in so far. We are just getting underway, but we will finish in the next lesson. We'll finish chapter one and then, of course, head into chapter two. And uh, next week, we're going to start with a little bit of uh, some of the problems they faced of Gnosticism. I'm going to define it to you before we even begin uh, reading scripture. It won't take long. And then we will be right into the word of God. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you have written to us, the encouragement. You've given us the path to walk. You've given us the steps to take and the tools and the wonderful, wonderful things that we have in Christ and the ability to serve him and to be a blessing to this world and to your people in church. Thank you for the example of this church. Thank you for Paul and the heart that this man shows all throughout his writings. It is great love for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.